Hey there, I'm back with the second season of My Viewfinder. The project this season is to work with co-host Alvin Paragut to discuss a broad range of topics that we invent on our Discord channel. If you're looking to get involved, want to guest star, suggest topics, or just give us some feedback, hit us up on the Instagram, which I think I'll go back on, email mvfpodcast at gmail.com. We're looking to reconnect with this art form, craft, hobby, love that we've lost touch with. So without further ado, season two, episode one of my viewfinder. We should introduce ourselves and talk about why we hate cameras now. Oh yeah, totally. Here, why don't you go first? I'm not very good at introductions. I just like to, you know, riff, go full send. Okay, fine. Uh, how do we want to start this first episode so we can be a little bit formal? I'm David Yan. I'm Alvin Perring it. And uh, we are here to start talking about photography. Alvin, why don't you quickly describe yourself in the lens of photography? Well, without sounding too cliche, um, I would consider myself a street photographer, although that term is a bit wishy-washy these days. What I do enjoy is just photography, really. Just the act of photographing. Uh, as long as the content is interesting, I'm, I'm going to shoot it no matter what. It doesn't have to be a certain genre. It just has to be interesting. Yeah, you've been doing it a long time. I mean, uh, we met in... 2017 maybe or something around then how did you start did you get a camera in high school you told me once but i forgot i borrowed my dad's dslr it was an olympus e800 or some shit like that and that's when i just started taking photos it was really for family events uh family gatherings and then i started shooting my friends taking portraits of them and then i was very much into hip-hop culture so I wanted to take photos of graffiti around the city, but I didn't really follow through with that. And then it wasn't a lot back in the day. No, there wasn't. Well, actually, you know what? There, there, there was quite a lot, especially with murals back in I want to say 2006, 2007, around Art Central, uh, where the Telus Building is right now. Uh, yeah, that yeah. alleyway over there, or what used to be an alleyway, there was a lot of graffiti murals along oh. that that alleyway. I eventually stopped taking an interest in photography, although I was still very much interested in taking photos of my friends with a little point and shoot. And then I became a dad and I wanted to take photos of my kids. So I bought a camera and the the interest in photography just kind of sparked again. And here I am spending thousands of dollars on gear. Yeah, you love your on gear. On books. <laughs> and well, yeah, yeah. I and mean, quickly, you're, you're Calgary born and raised. I think that's important to you, right? Yes. I picked up a camera uh, during a midlife crisis. In tw I bought one for myself 2014, maybe. It was after the floods. I was working in insurance. And uh, I had to work the floods as a property insurance field adjuster. So you can imagine that was not fun. Fun. <laughs> I already hated my job, <laughs> so that, that added fuel to the fire. And so when I got this bonus check for working uh, ungodly hours, uh, I decided I would just splurge. You know, I took pictures for a living, essentially, with a point of shoot as well. I mean, that's how you that's how you investigate claims. I had a little Canon Elf and some I don't know some that's what I was whatever using. the yeah whatever yeah. the company gives you. Yeah, after a while, it's fun. You're just like literally pointing and shooting. We're going to have to talk about the verbiage of uh, photography anyways, but uh, going out and, and and capturing all these pictures and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, people's so when misfortunes. I, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty <laughs> creepy. But there's, you know, there's a little bit of element of street there too, I think, where you're kind of a uh, voyeur, right? Yeah, or like documentation yeah, at, yeah, at its right. very core. Yeah, it's like reportage, except uh, to an evil corporation, right? <laughs> um, yeah. No, that's fair, unfair, but uh, to a corporation anyway. So I... Um, yeah, so about this camera, and then uh, I don't think we, yeah, I don't think our son was born yet, but uh, you know, it's Calgary. I moved here from Toronto, so you know, the beginning is all mountains and shit like that, which is cool. And then you and I met at a at a show. I think you and I first met at the Resolve show where uh, George, Greg, and Chris had some stuff up. I'm pretty sure. I believe we so. Briefly. Well, my first interaction with you was you actually just added me on Instagram. And we hadn't oh. met in person. And then we oh, okay. met cool, each other cool. in person at, was it Resolve? I want to say it's Resolve. I, I mean, think there, yeah, was, there was like some seminar going on there. And then that's when we, that's right. That's when we first met. 
And that was through perhaps Costas at the time. Probably Costas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Resolve is my anchor point into the Calgary photography art scene. I just want to ask, like, from taking photos for insurance purposes to to meeting at Resolve, like, what what happened in between? Yeah, that good question. I um, yeah, my life broke in half. <laughs> Uh, I guess, you know, the short form is that, yeah, I had a total basically psychotic breakdown and I was on like two years consecutive stress leave. One of the big things that I was doing when I wasn't just lying on the floor and debating how to end everything was go learning to hike. And I was bringing this camera out with a friend and then on solo hikes eventually. Around the same time we had our kid... And that was a total mindfuck too, because we don't have support here. And we were ill-prepared about how difficult that was going to be. And Helen was having, my wife uh, was having such a hard time and I was really not a good emotional sport at all. So uh, this camera became kind of a meditative tool when I had the presence of mind to actually go outside. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then for me, because everything was digital, I think one of the big maybe differences I've noticed between you and I is that... I didn't really hold photography, the art form or the craft of taking photos at such a high, high line mark. It was more just getting everything on the computer and then being able to fuck around with them. So yeah, just posting uh, essentially. <laughs> yeah. And just like learning how to, at first, yeah, first learning just general basic post-processing and then, um, and then realizing I can uh, muck around with it in a much more destructive way, which is fun. And that just became kind of a, an outlet. And that was the first time I did a show. Uh, I got this one night show at Phil and Sebastian's coffee shop here in Mission Spent so much fucking money. We'll talk about that too one day, framing <laughs> and putting this shit up on a wall. But yeah. it was so exciting. Once I started getting a little bit more stable uh, mentally, it was great to just take walks, you know, and be outside. And my kid was still really young. So whenever my wife and I could negotiate the time, I would just, yeah, fuck off into Calgary. And Calgary is pretty new to me too at that point. Um, so I would take pictures of anything. And street photography was still not as offensive as it is today. So taking pictures of people and... And all stuff wasn't, you know, ruffling feathers or making people upset yet, yep. to the most part. Yep. So it was really exciting. And uh, it was fun to just put that out. And that's why uh, we would have met on Instagram. Like, Instagram was still a photographer's tool. So by the time we met, I would have classified myself as kind of a street photographer too. But not in a purest sense, as I learned hanging out with you all these years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, even then, that, that term is just, it means nothing at the end. Because if you look at my photographs, even though I consider myself a street photographer, a lot of it is on the street, but a lot of it is also just family members. But the foundation of my work is that it's candid. Yeah. What is it? Documentarian? I would just say, like, I don't, I don't think genres really matter unless you're looking for something to sell. I don't think genres really matter. You're just a photographer. You're just doing the act of photography for whatever sake. For my sake, it's just because I want to take a photo of something because I find it interesting. Well, I, mean, I was thinking more philosophically, like documentarian is in mm, using this tool and craft of photography to record uh, moments or experiences as opposed to, let's say, uh, studio or art photography where there's so much more uh, intent in the formation of the photograph, mm -hmm. uh, which has its own thing. I, I don't know. I, I think there's, like you said, there's, it's, there's no real subgenres anymore. Photography is kind of folded in on itself, but there is kind of a thick line with uh, editorial or commercial photography, I think, where there's a, a pre-design almost in, you know, forming an image rather than recording one as it happens, maybe. Yeah, well, photography does have many different purposes. You weren't creating art when you had your company's camera doing documentation for insurance. But having said that, maybe, this is just a hypothetical, maybe you had a photo that would be considered art. The composition was great. The content was interesting, even though it's yeah. a bit of a tangent, but that's what makes photography so interesting to me because a lot of the time... You're not even really thinking about making art. You're just thinking about taking a, a picture, right? I think if you're out there to create art, I don't, I don't want to sound so purist, but you kind of take away 
from the act itself the it's intuition. not really photography at that point you're just you're just trying to conjure up you know what fuck no forget i said that i don't even know where no, i'm going no, this. you know what i i no, I'm, i i feel that i think what we're encroaching on maybe is the definition of the word photography and that's of course going to be ambiguous and it's going to <laughs> elicit some emotional response if anyone hears this because uh, we all mean different things, even when we're aligned, like this idea of a zone, you know, when I am getting into a flow of taking pictures, there's going to be a point where all of a sudden is not so uh, cerebral or intentional, and it becomes something more intuitive. Is that photography? Or is it the moment that I carry my camera out? And maybe I know like you're doing the graffiti project, or you go to a cipher, you go to an event, and you know that you're going to take pictures, whether they turn out or not, is that photography is uh, designing a project and, and executing is that photography? I don't know, is the development of film photography It's weird, because <laughs> everybody likes different parts of it, that, right? That's a good point to make. It's been a while since I've heard this quote. I remember uh, listening to a Gary Winogrand lecture, and he was making the argument that ads that use photography isn't really photography, it's illustration. I think this comes to play too with the idea of art. And, you know, just circling back to what we intended to talk about today, why I think both of us are a little bit disassociated or disillusioned with what we used to think of as a passion. Although we are doing this podcast, so clearly we still love photography at some level. But that uh, sense of whether this is real at all, what makes a picture good? I, not to be too much of a hater too, but often when I go to see exhibits or see what's popular, not that I'm on Instagram anymore, but let's say in the popular sphere or come across uh, photojournalism, or you sent me a few articles in the last couple of weeks, which question some of the ethics and morality and intent of content that's being created. I don't know how to define it for myself anymore. What is a picture? What is, yeah, like a painting or a, an image? What is content versus, you know, <laughs> versus art photograph? Yeah, it's <laughs> all it's all messy now, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, I don't know. What are words? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, this is, I mean, it's too abstract to necessarily call it a philosophy class, but I mean, this is the, the basis of philosophical thinking is arguing about semantics. Yeah. Like, it's I don't know. I'm actually reading uh, this one thing that Gary Winogrand said, and this is a quote from him. A photograph is not what was photographed. It's something else. To me, that's it's taking whatever was in the real world and transforming it into something different, something that that kind of gives you a, sus a suspension in disbelief. Say, for example, um, there's this one photo I took of a flock of birds and there was shit on the window. And you would think that like all these birds are coming towards me to, you know, to attack me or like take a shit. All oh, these birds to take a shit, shit yeah. on top of yeah. on top of my car. But the reality it was there was already poop on the window, and then there just happened to be a flock of birds, right? So you're transforming two totally different real world subjects, and I don't want to say make a narrative, but no, I think that's fair. Yeah, but it 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 does conjure up something different from reality. Would you say you had that intent when you hit the shutter? Or is that something you discovered after um, and contextualized? I, th I think it? I think it was just I think I was just focused on the flock of birds. I didn't even notice the shit until after. That's the interesting thing, and maybe part of my current uh, divorce from actually going out and bringing my camera all the time is that I am so conscious of being powerless to create context before I take a picture. I almost feel like I can't hit the shutter unless I know it's going to be cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's no, weird. I, I, I totally get that. One thing that I've kind of come to terms with is that, especially with street photography, with candid photography, there's no guaranteed way where you will have a great picture because 99% of the time, it's all luck. Say you're at Stampede, there's so many things going on, right? So much content that you can make out of. But you have to be at the right place at the right time to make the right photo. Because, yeah, you can take a photo of something interesting, but is the photograph in interesting? Whereas I could have the inverse thing happen. Say, for example, this one photo I took of a mural at the Seattle Surrey border. In real life, I was in queue at the border and I was waiting for 
for the officer patrols to to come check my car and so i just happened to take something boring but then when the image came out it was one of those images that someone has told me it happened it, it was a photo that happened something about it just made it interesting so what i'm really trying to get is it's it's all luck and and yeah hard, hard work consistency definitely plays a factor but there is no there's no formula to make good pictures you just have to be out and about at the right place at the right time and kind of hope for the best really if you think about it mathematically i mean if you're outside and you're shooting at one eight hundredth of a second <laughs> Yeah, it could be. Right? It just it doesn't make any sense. Something inconceivably short. That's what I've come to terms with, though. It's there. Are, there are no geniuses unless you're doing like editorial shit. But the, at that point, it's I don't know something different. It's illustration to me, right? You're kind of orchestrating shit to to make it a certain way. Um, you're already thinking about the the composition of what the photo is going to be. Right, it like and everything is all predetermined, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and if it comes out, if it comes out as your idea, yeah, that's that's great and all, but it's not interesting on itself. It's more so the idea of it is interesting. Whereas you can take something totally boring, totally mundane, and flip it upside down. It it'll be an interesting photograph that's just burned into your mind. Listening to you, I'm thinking what this part of our conversation today is really begging at is uh, this idea of what makes art in general. So before we worry about capitalism and consumerism and, and sort of the leveraged idea of making an earning with uh, creativity, it's like, even when you look at the classics, you know, like what is it that an image, intentional or not, speaks at the human mind or the human soul or whatever you want to call it and can transcend just being a cave painting. I mean, we value cave paintings now less for their artistic merit and more just for the historical significance. Mm -hmm. But you look at, um, I mean, let's say Renaissance painters as a huge example, basic stereotypical one. What is it about it that uh, we cherish? Is it the art? Is it the historical context? I don't know. Because photography has a disjointed relationship with that. It's not respected as an art in, in a pure sense. I think there's something weird about falling in love with this <laughs> process that was yeah. inherently never going to find a foothold in creativity. I, I agree with you. I think um, throwing money into, if you want to call it the art form, it adds an unnecessary stress and pretense to it. Some of the most expensive photographs in the world are not the best photographs. Like that one photograph of, what was it, the fucking, that one in like the cave it was it was like the highest selling photograph of all time here. Let me let me search it up most in the edit. Most expensive photograph. Oh, this Blank. one right here. 2014 for a price of 65 million, but to me it's not it's not that interesting. Here's the thing though. It could be interesting to someone else, right? I mean, this um, is yeah, I mean, usually we art, case. the way I view it, art is that um it's a medium which conveys some sort of idea, right? and whatever whatever idea that you get from that or how it makes you feel that's where the value is the perceived value adding money to it is just makes it it makes a material difference but at the end of the day you're kind of just looking at it and you're like what the fuck <laughs> like is like is this supposed to be good for the record we're looking at peter lick, lick. let's say phantom peter uh, lick my balls and just reading uh, the description. This photo was taken in an area known as Antelope Canyon in Arizona, USA, by Peter Lake, actually. I don't know, two two different uh, spellings. Interesting. Auctioned in 2014 for a price of $65 million bucks. And then, uh, interestingly, as well, they've said uh, here, the buyer's list is private and anonymous, which means this sale cannot be verified. And I think we should definitely spend a little time later on... Uh, maybe critiquing fine art as a business. Well, yeah, uh, that's true because suspect man. A lot of these things are just tax write-offs, right? <laughs> There's something, right? There's a game. There's yeah. definitely a little bit of a. It's not shell really game. That the the art is valuable, but more so it's taxes. And well, this you know, is, the funny yeah. thing is, uh, now that I think about it, in one of the many Winogrand lectures that I listened to. He does mention that. <laughs> uh, there's books, and I've read as well about, uh, yeah, American capitalist, um, 
I don't know, poison, but the influence on fine art as we understand today, as a recent call out, you know, this NFT so-called boom in art that lasted all of one year or whatever, uh, was the same problem is this idea that the art itself has the value that is assigned by the market, which is not actually true. You know, I, I think even with the classic, you say Mona Lisa allegedly is the most important painting in some circles, and it will have some kind of uh, valuation. But from a purely mechanical standpoint, as far as aged canvas framing and paint, you know, it, it's not that those things have value or, you know, it's weird. It's a weird thing to attribute a number. So this photograph, I'm guessing as a physical object and not to the uh, rights of the details of the image itself, $65 million. What does that even mean? Other than <laughs> we all wish we had $65 million, right? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> that is true. But, you know, just to rewind even more, because I wanted to get us back on where we're at today, you said... You know, often taking what might have been a boring moment in picture in later viewing might have created a, a strong photograph. You know, why why aren't we shooting boring pictures, Alvin? Why are we meeting at coffee shops and talking about uh, why we won't take pictures anymore if what we really need to do is just go out, be bored, and, and take another 100,000 shitty frames? Uh, what's going on? Well, I think it's because I don't want to muck up my hard drives even more. <laughs> I lost a big one last year. It's fucking crazy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With tens of thousands of boring photos. I don't know. I think just having coffee is more fun. <laughs> oh, for sure. When I look at my uh, divorce from Instagram and uh, being a little shell-shocked, you know, obviously COVID, everybody talks too much about COVID now, but it is a big <laughs> cultural problem, right? We lost two years of... Uh, Three, of, actually. Uh, three years of innocence and and i definitely had a break uh through that i didn't even go outside so living in a cave there's only so much you can take a photograph of yep. uh, but frankly i'm kind of scared to take pictures now i, I had that little altercation just before covid i and remember really, with, with scott yeah we were uh, essentially attacked uh, by a very angry short racist homophobe and uh I mean, I realized, you know, years after that Scott and I could have easily pressed charges to him. He fucking grabbed Scott's camera and tried to break it. If it wasn't tied to him, it, you know, that would have been, it's, you know, constitutes an actual assault. But more importantly, it made me think about why I was even out taking pictures. It ruined the fun of it. I mean, Scott and I were out an hour before that happened. I was literally on the way back. And so that, that creeps, uh, you and I know this last couple of years, just the minority status and being visible in the street uh, as a non-white photographer is a problem. We were, I think we're more easily accosted than, uh, than others. Um, but it also makes me think like, why am I taking these pictures of people in Calgary? I don't, I don't know anymore. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I want to do it for. So well, that's weird. I'll tell you one thing it, for me, for myself, I remember when I had, I had a really good run around 2015 to 2017 just literally taking photos every day doesn't really matter what the subject was taking photos within calgary was such a fresh it was a fresh feeling um the act of photography at that time was fresh right just coming up with something that constantly felt new and as time went on for for myself i just ended up repeating the same workflow i would say which you know you repeat something time and time and it gets old it gets stale right that was street photography for me which was at the time the most exciting genre that i could possibly do i'm not into doing portraits i'm not into doing landscapes i'm not into doing like freak shit i guess <laughs> but uh yeah it just got boring it just got boring and repetitive and the the work to reward ratio was just not it and mm -hmm. then covid happened it kind of killed it for me because afterwards i tried doing it again and something it, it just wasn't the same you know yeah and also i think when when covid happened literally every photographer was trying to make their magnum opus work with the pandemic you know just mm -hmm. <laughs> just empty taking photos of empty streets yeah, 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 yeah. 
families in their homes. And it's like, from a documentation point of view, I see value in that. But the photographs themselves are just, it's boring. There were, there were I will say though, there, there were some very, very interesting work coming out of sure during that yeah, time. Yeah. I don't know. There's so much more noise, right? It's like, it's hard. It's hard to feel like you're doing something special. It's hard to have fun with it. Even though I shouldn't be comparing myself to other people, it's hard not to, right? Because we're so interconnected now. We have to get, you know, some people we know that are like still heavy into it to kind of explain to us why they're still passionate. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. Like who would be? Probably Chris Malloy. Is he still doing his i don't know i don't talk to him anymore uh scott a little bit but he works in the industry right he's a director so that's a little Mm -hmm. different louis maybe louis Louis the most technical guy he's more of a craftsman right like i met him at that event and he's talking about emulsions and different chemicals and shit yeah we should ask that question too like is that photography i I don't know it's it's fascinating to talk to him he's like a scientist so Uh, i met with caitlin a couple weeks ago and she's also a little disillusioned even though she's a professional photographer it's i think everyone's space (laughs) Yeah. It seems like everyone's disillusioned in some way. Yeah. I know I was, for sure. Especially after I tried quitting Instagram. Actually, I, I did quit in- Instagram or photography. And then I tried starting it back up again. But now I realize that it's not it's not the same. But the caveat was having Instagram made me made me keep doing it a little bit more. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's like, oh, maybe maybe there's some content I can post, but it's just content. It's not shit that I like. You know, I just had this thought about, you know, one of the topics I wrote down we should talk about is uh, photographers' relationship to where they are with the lens. Like, I, I hate getting my picture taken, uh, but I'll take pictures of things. Is Instagram or, you know, um, public forums for photographers a way for us to project who we are through our work? You know, it's like to be seen, ironically almost, uh, without us being seen. Most photographers I know don't post selfies, you know, uh, I think. You know, I think it's more just trying to post the pictures that they took. So there's a weird dichotomy in that. It's there like, is. Also, it's it's like if you just keep posting for Instagram, is it really your work? Or is it is the work being done because of you? Or is it being done because of engagement? Truth be told, yeah, for me engagement was a factor oh, yeah. for sure it's got to be both and maybe it's swung too far one way i don't know for myself when i was you know when i had like i didn't even have that many followers like 600 followers right but i would i would post selfies i would post work that maybe other people would have liked right there was there was a bit of ego being projected onto that instagram account which is fair game but when i create my zines my projects that was a whole different story uh because i don't know it was like it wasn't my ego but more so my my interests are those two different things i don't know i i don't think so but i certainly didn't see myself in those projects i just saw the work and obviously the interest because why else would i why else would i create that project but that's also something like i think projects like that ultimately matter the most it's tangible right something you could touch instagram is yeah. for the most part instagram is not it is it's real, not real but it's not real it's not tangible one of the first things i remember liking about costas is he told me that you're not a photographer until you've printed your first image which i thought was a neat way to put it. i mean he's a printer so it's a little biased <laughs> but i thought that was very interesting for me because yeah once it's a tactile object uh, it holds a different value but yeah, if we're asking why did I make it into an object, was it to seek validation? Was it to sell a commodity? Was it to get it, you know, into the real world? I, I don't know. Obviously, don't have an answer for that. I will say now because I'm so much more jaded, I almost feel like I won't print something unless I think someone will buy it. Because <laughs> there's a huge That's cost funny. involved, right? There is. It's, yep. it's weird. For me, I, I I totally get you from that end. I won't print something nice <laughs> unless someone's gonna buy it but fuck I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna print something if i find it interesting and it's not gonna be on my really expensive computer or at a real print shop It'll, it's gonna be at walmart right just because i want to yeah. see like i just want to view the <sighs> what's the word i'm looking for i guess just the photograph i just wanted to view the photograph 
Yeah, there's something to be said about even the scale of print versus your computer. Like, you know, I've both gone out with little Instamax cameras. And then, I, I, I mean, I've seen some of your shows where we print pretty big. And I've made a few images that are printed quite large. And it's different, right? It always feels different because when it's an object, it has a different context too. It's like, it's weird. You know, I was just also thinking the flip side, like if you do it just for purity, you get the mythology of a Vivian Mayer, right? It's like, yeah. you know, she never existed until someone found this box of shit. Yeah. Was and she a photographer the, then? Because yeah, it's weird. she didn't print her photo. Well, she did. But she didn't show anybody while she was alive. <laughs> it's uh, almost like a, the, uh, what's that saying? It's like, if you... It's if you if you chopped a tree in a forest and no one heard it, did you really chop a tree or some shit? Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It doesn't make a sound or yeah, it's weird. Like uh, there's a I came across this woman. I think I saw it in a magazine article. She's kind of like a Vivian Meyer, but she's alive. So uh, she is a <laughs> Korean woman. So she's not Vivian Meyer. <laughs> well, in in, the, in this one sense, which is that she uh, she's a Korean woman who. Um, during Japanese occupation, but before the war, her family moved to Hawaii. And so after the Korean War was finished, she, her dad had just bought her a point-and-shoot uh, color film camera. And when they went to go visit, she just took candid photographs everywhere she went. And then when they were developed, she just kept them in a box. And her daughter, like five years ago, found this box. And these pictures are fantastic, not only because she actually turned out to be a very good photographer in terms of composition, but they're showing a part of Korean history that, you know, exists, but they're in full color. It's not a reporter. It's not been uh, created into propaganda from some, you know, dictator in Korea during the 60s, 70s. And so she's putting on shows and developed a book, but it's her daughter doing all this work, but she's now getting interviewed for these magazines. This our original photographer had no interest in sharing these pictures with anybody. <laughs> they were in a box in an attic, right? So, yeah, that stuff's weird, right? It's like... Does it have more value now that we can see it in a museum or did it have value inherently because it was taken? Strange. That is strange. I think it was a, in that case, maybe it, maybe it was just more valuable because it had more eyes on it. Hmm. Right. Same with the Vivian Meyer story. Yeah. Just a bunch of, you know, old dusty negatives, maybe a print here and there. And then it got shown on a Flickr group and more eyes laid on top of them and it just blew up it just became more valuable i don't know the idea of value like uh, when you and scott scott mallow where you keep talking about did your um was it i can't remember when you did your talk was about street photography or about photography in general but scott was doing that project redeveloping his dad's negatives and build or his dad's photos and that it's kind of the same idea it's like where does the value come in it's weird. The idea of value is kind of fucked up, you know? Like, I look at my iPhone the other day, and I have pictures of my... You'll do this, too. We'll have pictures of our kids, ridiculous candidates, because they're too fat or doing something really stupid or crying or falling off shit. And it's hilarious, because they're adorable. Is that not a good photograph, because we would never sell it? Because <laughs> they're done on an iPhone 5, and the resolution's garbage. It's perceived value, because a photo of my kid that I thought was great cute would not be important to someone else it's unless you became super kid. famous yeah but maybe the photo was great then it's like oh yeah this is the content doesn't matter but the photograph itself has value yeah you've shown me some of your family pictures that you take in a documentary so some of them are great but yeah would we sell it i mean you sent me that article we'll talk about it about uh, that photographer who made an art project oh sally her Man. children yeah the children in the nude and uh We'll try to get to an episode talking about exploitation, etc. But yeah, stuff's weird, man. Why can't we take pictures anymore? <laughs> I take pictures, but uh, it feels different. Well, what what do you now. mean when you say why can't I take photos anymore? I just I find it uh, stressful, you know. Not when I'm finally out with the camera. Um, like the other day, I was out. Uh, I decided intentionally to bring a camera out, and I drove. I can't remember if I was doing Aaron first, but ultimately ended up at Glenmore Reservoir, just taking pictures of the snowy path and trees and shit. And uh, it made me think about how, if I'm going to run away from urban human street photography, other than sort of architectural things, then maybe I should go back out and try to take pictures of landscapes or nature or something, just to literally get a breath of fresh air. And in the moment that I'm taking photographs, it reminded me of 
five or six years ago of just just being out there and part of something, not worrying about whether someone's going to have to see it or how it posts this on Instagram or how it's going to stitch it together. And that part was very cathartic and meditative, but I haven't been out since. You know, you think that if I enjoyed it, that I would go and participate in it again, and I didn't. So I, I don't know. There's something broken there, I think. I can't tell you what it is, but we don't have to solve it, but that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the issue for sure. It's uh, some. I think not even just you and I, just a, a thing that everyone kind of contends with. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's I like the idea of continuing to photograph, but for myself, I have no interest in like what the world is around me at the moment. Mm. And if I have no interest in the world, then I have no interest in photographing, right? Fuck, I keep going back to Winogram, but it's like a, photo a photographer's <laughs> relationship to his medium is, rela is the relationship to his world, is the relationship mm. to his medium. So maybe we're just too cynical in general. I think so. I, I, think, I, th I think you have to look at the world with like some sort of, not even optimism, but... Hope, faith... Like there has to be an interest, whether whether it is optimistic or not. You know what I mean? Because you can you can be pessimistic about war, but still have an interest in it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that that kind of just reflects my state of the medium right now. I'm just not interested in the world right now. I'm not interested in my immediate surroundings. If I travel somewhere, yeah, it's new to me, but I don't have that luxury, right? So that's why photo photography has just been on the back burner for me. Not even since COVID, but like since 2018, just because, you know, things have gotten stale. Uh, the way I look at the world, uh, the way that the world responds to me. Really, I'm just, what I'm saying is that I've just become a boring person. <laughs> Maybe we can't take photographs at least with joy because of our disillusionment. And so there's some play on words where... Because we're dealing with a visual medium, our disillusionment is preventing us from building images about it. It's weird because when you were talking about it, that's how I feel like too. I've been hating on the world and, and now I'm unable to take photos of it. Yeah, it's it really depends on how you, the photographer, responds to the world, right? And that's really how you just get photos. Not even an interesting photograph, just photos in general. Personally, I don't like to photograph when I'm in a bad mood, but when I'm in a good mood, when the world around me seems a bit more optimistic, then yeah, I'm I'm just buzzing around. Ultimately, the act of photographing just relies on vibes, really. Mm. <laughs> it's just vibes. <laughs> yeah, man. It's glib, but I think it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Not because you're on a mission to do something. It's, it's just vibes. <laughs> just vibes, man. That's how I listen to music. Isn't that how we consume art anyway? Because it makes us I feel do. good, right? Dude, that. Because it's uh, literally just vibes. Not because that? you're looking at things mathematically or because well, it costs a lot. It's just how it makes you feel, right? I'm the it's asshole. Just vibes. I went to Paris and spent maybe four hours at the Louvre and I was like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. When I tell some people that they, they look upset, but whatever. All right, cool, cool. What, what do you want to try to talk about next? We've just covered briefly everything we've been brainstorming about talking about. So let's pick a topic. Um, I, I think we just scratched the surface yes. on the things we talked about. Do you want to talk about how it's like a pay to play kind of game all right let's talk about uh commercial art culture and get ourselves in really big trouble yeah whatever uh, all right let's cares. aim for that episode two i'm nobody i'm nobody <laughs> so my opinion should not matter to anyone listening really it's public discourse the internet Alvin. we're already <laughs> celebrities right? i'm just a guy who had <laughs>